Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners. I'm your host, Jen Fink. With me today is Nina Sosman Pogue. Yeah, I think I did it. And on top of being a former U.S. gymnast and an Emmy winning journalist as if that's not enough accomplishment she's also kind of a past caregiver kind of a current caregiver depends on how you look at the family situation and we are going to be talking about finding resilience and purpose in caregiving and purpose is really important because most of us end up doing this this job with no training no warning nothing so it can can sometimes feel a little alienating. So thanks for joining me, Nina. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, Jen. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you. So why don't you give my listeners your background? As I was saying before we hit record, it's easier that way. That way I don't mess it all up. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. So I have a very storied background. Uh, it's It's been an interesting winding path for me. I was uh, on the U.S. gymnastics team, as you mentioned, uh, back with Mary Lou back in the day. Uh, in the 80s. And then I went to college and was an L- a gymnast at LSU. And then I got into television and I won an Emmy for Best Newscaster in the Southeast and some journalism awards for environmental reporting, some other things like that. Uh, and then I got into tech and went from TV to tech. And I had some great success there. I worked at a software service, big SaaS company uh, that did benefits, the back end system for benefits. And uh, we took that company public. It was a big win there. But what I talk about and what I do is not those things, not the resume <laughs> stuff. I really, as I've told you before, I talk about all the other stuff, what I call the stuff below the line of my failures and struggles along the way. So along with those things. So on the U.S. team, then I didn't make the Olympics, crushing at the age of 16, you know, when I was in the cover of magazines and a hopeful and moved away from home, all the things. So then I got into college and you know, found myself again. And then I blew out my knee, lost my identity. Who was I without gymnastics? And then I found my way into journalism and had some big success there. And then one point I got fired. I got let go in budget cuts after being you know, voted Charleston's favorite news anchor 10 years in a row. So a you know, very public you know, embarrassment that that happened. Uh, and then I found my way, you know, into tech and had success. You kind of see the ups and downs. I also had a real traumatic experience um, when I was 37, one that really had me questioning whether I was going to go on or not. So really have been up and down. And then at later in life, I became a caregiver for my father who had Alzheimer's uh, and my mother or dementia and my um, great aunt who I, my mother named me after um, Nina um, she had was also had Alzheimer's and she was actually almost 20 years in a facility, like in a memory oh. care facility. Yeah. Yeah. Really long, long journey for her and her family. Um, but uh, they have both since passed. I uh, lost my daddy in uh, 2019. So it's been a few years since since uh, he passed. And I still do a lot of work with the Alzheimer's Association and the rides and the walks and things. There you go. That's me in a nutshell. <laughs> That's a big nutshell, too. I don't think most of us have quite so many highs and lows. We have ups and downs, but you know, I since we're recording this right before the 2024 Olympics begins, you know, I'm looking at the you know, the trials. I'm like, why don't they have like an overall score for the season? And then maybe the trials is like the fun finale. Like why is it all based on like two days? <laughs> Just isn't it make so much sense. yeah, I mean it's back and forth about that. I really have strong feelings about that. Um and I I see both ones. You want someone when they're peaking, you know, that at their peak, uh, which makes perfect sense, especially in something like gymnastics where an injury or um growing <laughs> can affect your performance. But even in you know, track and field and some of the other ones and swimming. It, I always think, wait, 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 maybe this wasn't their best day. But, you know, are they peaking or are they not in the best shape? So I get I get both sides of it. But it's heartbreaking to watch and see some of these athletes not make it. Yeah, because I believe there were some American gymnasts that didn't make it because of injuries. I know one gal pulled out. I don't, I don't yeah. follow it that closely. I mean, of course, you can't really avoid the Simone Biles coverage, which is... Yeah. I've there seen, were I think several... I've seen her- yeah, I mean, there were that's several just terrible. 
at the Olympic trials in the warmups. I mean, and they were supposed to be number two and number three, and they did not get to compete because they had uh, both had leg injuries. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. And then you so said you blew, blew out your pregnant. knee in college. That's not. I mean, that's devastating on multiple levels. Well, it was difficult because I kind of found myself again after not making the Olympics and and trying to you know regroup and figure out who I was after moving away from home and. As I said, like on the cover of magazines, when you don't make it, very public embarrassment. Like I was just ashamed. I thought it was such a loser. Didn't want to go back to my high school, like the 16-year-old, 17-year-old stuff. But then once I was in college, it was this, I really felt you know, like I'd found my people again and was was on the right path. And then I didn't know who I was without gymnastics after I blew out my knee and could not do the sport anymore. So it was a real big struggle to figure out how to keep going forward from that. And that's what I talk about is how... When, when these things hit us um, in our lives, and mine are high highs and low lows. I mean, everybody has your own highs and lows. When these things hit us, how do we not just survive these, but thrive on the other side? How do we become more resilient? And if people are listening and you're a caregiver, you are in a chapter of your life. It is not your whole life. I mean, those years when I took care of my dad, um, it felt like my whole life. And now my mom was you know, there too. I was one of one of his caregivers. We tag teamed a lot. Uh, but it was, it was, um, a, a chapter in my life and a very difficult one. Uh, but it was not my whole life and there is life after this. And that's part of what I hope people get from our discussion today is how to get through this with your sanity and all the things that you need, <laughs> you know, and then get on the other side and don't let this define you go on and, and have a really, not just, you know, survive this, but have a really uh, exciting life and, and, and full life on the other side of it, because, that is where um, you become more resilient. That's where you can tap into everything that you've gone through. Which makes perfectly good sense. I know, you know, on social media, there's caregivers sharing their grief journeys. And it's because we have so few options for elder care, especially older adults with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, it becomes your whole life. I mean, if you can't afford a memory care community or you know, quite a bit of paid in-home help. You know, we've got far too many people leaving the workforce um, because they don't have a choice. And then your person dies and you're like, well, okay, now what? And you're in your 40s, 50s, and maybe you would like to go back to work because you could use some money because, you know, it's, you, right. know, you haven't been, you've been living on, you know, slim, slim, finances for a while to take care of your loved one we know that caregivers spend about 850 dollars a month out of their own pocket which is difficult if you're not working mm -hmm. i'd certainly like to know how to come up with 850 with no income <laughs> yeah um so it's it's really tough and i i started my show because i needed better advice and inspiration than i could find online um my mom i started became responsible for my mom in 2017. And at that point, you did not share your loved one's care journey on social media. Absolutely. You know, you want to talk about cancel culture, that would have happened to you. You just would have been shunned off the internet. And I get it. Um, I didn't totally disagree, but I kind of felt like people needed to know. So I shared a little bit about my mom, but not as much as people started doing in 2020 when everything changed. Yes. And of course my mom passed away at the start of the pandemic. So it was like, well, I don't have the everyday kind of thing to share. So it's been an interesting journey. And I did not think about what would happen with the podcast after her passing. She was only 77. And because it was the pandemic, I didn't have anything else to do. So I just kept going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did. I'm sure your listeners really appreciate the fact that you did. Well, if you guys do, send me an email occasionally. It'd be nice to hear from people. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Help help her out, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. It would be helpful. Yeah, because you do. It's very isolating. You know, I when I, I was very fortunate. So I was a vice president in a tech company at the time when my father was diagnosed. Um, and my mom's still living, but she was here in town. So I went to our leadership team when, when it got to be a lot for my mom and she was getting no break. And I was worried about losing both of them because she was under so much stress and so you know angry and agitated and exhausted all the time. 
um, I was worried about losing both of them. So I said, you've got to give me some, you know, we've got to tag team this. So I went to my leadership team and I said, I'm not going to work on Thursdays and I'm going to be off the charts on, I'm, I'm going to be offline on Saturdays as well. Cause we, you know, in, in most companies now you're at that level expected to kind of be on all the time. And so they were real supportive. I did an FMLA and I put it in as a family medical leave act and I, use that to be able to step away. And I just didn't work on Thursdays and Saturdays. And I could get emails and stuff on Thursday. And I would check on occasion because I was there with him. But it gave my mom a chance to go one to a support group, which I had to take her to pushing and, and shoving and did not want to go kicking and screaming, I guess they call it. Uh, but yes, very helpful for her. Uh, and really special time for me and my dad, you know, to just spend time together. So did that for about three years, about two and a half, three years. Um, and I would, and the other days I would work out early in the morning, right near when he got into memory care year later at the last year or so, um, I would work out early in the morning and then be there when he got up to have coffee with him, you know, every morning and spend some time with him. Um, and he knew who I was right up to the end, which I thought was such a blessing because as I was saying, my aunt Nina spent almost 20 years in a facility and didn't remember her people at all in my cousins. She had four girls and a boy, her, those four girls had a really tough time with that, it was, it was very different. So that's my, my journey in that I really do encourage people to do have a plan for after, um, you forget when you're in the middle of it, it feels like it's everything. And like that life's never going to be normal or happy again. You really do. Like it's hard oh, to I, picture. I, I agree. And my, my dad passed away March 2nd, 2017. We moved my mom to memory care March 16th and his funeral was March 18th. Blah. So you know, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, heartless. I actually really wish we'd moved her to memory care while he was on hospice because her being home with him, I don't think helped anybody. Um, they kind of had a contentious relationship and she didn't understand. I, you know, you know, things are different in your world when the hospice team tells you they enjoy that you're, um, dark sense of humor and it's like um <laughs> is that a compliment i'm not so sure that's a compliment <laughs> but there was one day my dad was just being just a feisty old cougar with his um caregivers the in-home caregivers we had while he was on hospice and i stepped in to kind of try to diffuse things didn't work my husband and i were in the kitchen heads together talking quietly to each other my mom popped her head between the two of us and she goes you should just go in there and tell them to drop dead. It was like, oh my lord, oh, that's so crass. They just say anything though. There's just no filter. There's no. Filter. Well, she had no clue that he was dying, so right. she had zero clue. He was right. just being his normal, you know, crotchety self. <laughs> and it was just like, oh my lord, you know, it's just like you want to laugh, you want to cry. It's just like God forbid. So yeah. you know, my mom was in memory care, but and you, you're probably aware of this. That does not relieve you of the stress and the burden and all those feelings, it just lessens it some, you know, you're, you're, Correct. you're not the 24 seven person other than emotionally and somewhat intellectually, I think, cause you know, you're, I always called myself the captain of mom's care team. Like I was in charge of my mother making sure things went right, but there was the caregivers from the community that were helping her and we all worked pretty well together. Um, they didn't like to call me before my visits, they would wait till we were coming back in and they'd be like, oh, your mama needs toilet paper. Your mama needs. I'm like, you couldn't have told me that. Like we just passed the CVS. Okay. <laughs> now I got to go make a UE and I got to come back in here and hope she doesn't see me. I was like, oh my God, could you guys just coordinate this a little better? But yeah, well, I guess it all they're juggling out. a lot. Yeah. yeah. I, I really, I really appreciated the people uh, where, where daddy was. He was, um, he became very sweet. He was a very serious man in his life. He was an old Navy guy, 30 something years in the Navy, very structured. He was not exactly, you know, a huggy kind of dad, you know, uh, he, very stern. And then through dementia, he just became this teddy bear of a human. So I really enjoyed visiting him. But you do, you, you I, I like you said, you were the captain of the care team. I looked at myself as I'm his person. You know, mom, mom was his his wife and there for him, but somebody had to kind of run the ship and take care of things when, when it got, when it got, um, you know, keep things moving forward and just have a, a, a sturdy rock that they could lean on. So if he fell in the night, I was the one that called and met the, met the ambulance, the emergency room, which happened several times. 
uh, or if something else, you know, were to go wrong, it was usually me. And it was nice to be able to spare my mother, who was the same age as my dad. She was 85 at the time. Um, she's 90 now and healthy and has a wonderful brain. I'm so hoping that part of me goes in that direction. Uh, <laughs> but I do. That's one of the reasons I do so much with Alzheimer's work now with the Alzheimer's Association um, and the Indoll's walks and the bicycling and stuff is because I know I'm likely next. I'm 57. There's just a matter of time before, you know, this happens to me as well. And I'm very aware of the, you know, the the foods and the drugs and the things that you can do to try to keep that at bay. But back to the caregiver piece, it's really important um, to, to play your role, you know, to play your role in this, but it's just a role. It is not your whole story. It's just a part of who you are. It's, you can't let it become everything that you are and lose yourself, which I think some people, it's very easy to do becomes your, because, because it comes the full-time job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through, I think, through lack of choices and options, and right. everybody's personalities are different. You know, when you have to step away from the workforce because you don't have, you know, enough caregivers, money, et cetera, in your corner, right. it does become your whole life. Oh, I For was me, very I, fortunate. I kind of felt like, um, I mean, I never verbalized that I was the captain of the care team to the staff where mom lived because I just kind of felt like it was obvious, but I really felt like sometimes they forgot I was the daughter. I was just like the one that had to get things done. And it was, and they understandably to a point forgot that I had my own responsibilities. I had my own photography studio to run clients to deal with. And you know, that when you're creating beautiful family portraits for clients, you can't be, having somebody calling you and saying, well, mom's refusing to go to the hair salon with the hair gal and, or mom's this, and, you know, it's like, just leave me the hell alone. You know, it's like, right. You really get sucked in. So how would you counsel my listeners to keep some things that it like maybe an arm's length, you know, keep things for yourself so that you're not 110% caregiving. And then when your person is gone, now you're just adrift in the world trying to figure out like where, who am I? What am I supposed to be doing now? Cause that's very difficult when you're grieving. It's very difficult. And, and, and that's the word grieving is, is the key to that. Everybody grieves at different rates. So you have to take care of you. I mean, the amount of time it takes you to step back into the world is totally up to you. Everybody's different. Um, and you have to go through the stages of grief and, you know, all of that back and forth over and over until you get to this level of acceptance and go, okay, wow, this is my life. What now? And the what now piece is what I really have spent a lot of time on in any situation. And in this one, it works just the same. And I would encourage anyone to um, put it in, I, I call it this, whatever your this is. So for all of your listeners, this is being a caregiver. It is this thing that you wake up with and have to do every day and it fills up all your time and energy and you go to bed at night and you're still thinking about it. Like it just takes up all the space in your brain. So I encourage people to, you know, take out a piece of paper and draw a horizontal line across it, do it horizontally and draw a line across it and put zero at one end and a hundred on the other. And this is your piece of paper, not your parents or your persons you're taking care of. And put the dots there and figure out where you are. If you, Like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way up to 100. Put 10 dots on that page across that timeline. And you can put a dot in where you are right now. So I was in my 50s when I was taking care of my dad. It was early 50s. So I could put a dot right there and go, oh, look, I'm in the middle. I'm right here at 50. And these five or six years in the middle there um, with this, you know, just a dot on that line and not my whole big, messy, marvelous life with the highs and lows. It was just a dot right there. And by doing that, you can kind of shrink it down and put it in perspective of it's part of my life, not my whole life. And I encourage people to put all your other stuff, all the stuff you did before on that line too. Like put something, got married, got divorced, did the, like whatever it is, just put all your stuff on the lines. So you can see what your life looks like, places you lived, when you had children, whatever, place, you know, careers. Anyway, that's the, the first piece. That's the T, that's the timeline. So drop the, this that you're dealing with into the timeline and then put a line on each side of it. And you have to kind of do this in your head. You can't go back to the back. I wish I had. I would have, could have, should have. Because any good therapist will tell you if you're spending all your time in the would have, should have, that's where depression lives. If you spend all your time thinking about the past. And then you have a line on the other side of it, too. Because if you spend all your time in the what ifs and everything's ruined and doomsday scenarios, then that's where anxiety lives. 
So you have this kind of magical little lines on both sides. Like you're right here at this dot. And now is the only thing you have control over. Not the anxiety, not the depression, not the anxiety. And then I have people draw a circle around it. And I say, okay, who's in this with you? <laughs> because people who get success, they don't go it alone. So when you draw a circle around it, you can pull in people like if you feel really alone in it. We all feel very alone in whatever this is that we're dealing with. And you have to pull some people in to support you. And maybe you have to edit some people out who are not helping. You can take all the people in your life and go, these are helping, these are not. And you have to edit those people uh, when you hit a big this. And then the last part is the, 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 the tips. That's T-I-P, P is people. And then the S is story. And what is the story that you are creating here? It's the words in your head that come out of your mouth that become your story. Is this horrible and ruined and terrible? What's the language is that that you're in your head that's coming out of your mouth? Or is it this is challenging? This is difficult. This is a, a tough chapter. Um, this is I need help. Like the words in your in your head come out of your mouth and that becomes your story. Uh, and the most important thing about that, so you have this all written on this piece of paper, the line, the dot, the lines on the side of it in the circle, and then you write, this is. But the most important thing of that, you can talk to anybody who's gone through this Alzheimer's journey. It's actually pretty fascinating because it's finite. I mean, it's sooner or later you lose a person. Um, and you can block off how many years that was. And it's not your whole life. It's a section of time in your big giant lifetime. It is not your whole life. And people get stuck there because it's hard to get out of. But yeah. once you, yeah, you know, but once you can look at it that way and go, wait, I've got 30 years ahead of me or 25, however many years you have. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm hoping I have 40 years ahead of me. I'd like to break the curve and live to be in my 90s like my mother. Um, but I have all these years. What am I going to do with those? And then you can start to imagine what life's going to look like five years from now. Not where you are right now, but what will life look like five years from now? And then you can do one thing today that the you five years from now is going to be happy you did. Maybe it's in that downtime, you're reading certain books or you're, you know, cooking your favorite meal or you're stretching on the floor, whatever it is to bring you a little, you know, that little bit of you sit in chairs for a long time. I found that I'm like, anytime I could like crawl on the floor and stretch and move my body, it was like the weirdest thing. But, you know, what can you do? Just one thing right now to take care of you. So five years from now, you still have you. Yeah. Yeah. I like that you pointed out stretching because my what I was going to say is five years from now, you is going to really appreciate that you, you know, went to your annual wellness checkups. And, you know, I kind of advocate for general physicians need to learn how to basically do both at once, like take care of your dad and you and yeah. or me and my mom, because getting out of the house to take somebody with Alzheimer's to the doctor is very difficult it's but very getting your, difficult yeah but getting yourself out of the house without them is equally as difficult <laughs> and none of us wants to take that difficult challenge and go to the doctor like you know you're gonna you're go, exhausted you're yeah, exhausted like, oh yeah you know, and then they ask you how you, or your blood pressure's up and they're ragging you about your blood pressure and it's like <laughs> duh yeah it's like you want well, to come I'm live my life <laughs> and it was you know like crawl you know climbing mount everest to get here so yeah i'm sure my blood pressure's up Yes. Um, what other five year things should we do? You know, eating yeah. healthy, just little things. You feel so much better mm -hmm. when you eat right, but I do yeah. 10 minute full body stretches every day. Um, 99% of the time. Today I did a 10 minute lower body stretch because that's how I worked out was lower body for the last two days. So, and I'm like, let's do a lower body stretch. And it's there you like, go. That's only that's 10 minutes. Man, that goes by so fast. And it is. It is. And you can do that while you're caring for somebody. You can actually, you know, find they're they're in their own little world at times and to get in a 10 minute stretch or to go make yourself a cup of tea or to look out the window and listen to the birds and look, remind yourself, look, I'm alive all by myself. This is me. Um, it's really healthy. The the one of the worst times I had, um, my mother had a fall. So after we Ooh. lost my dad, then my mom had a fall. And had a, a like a big fall, brain bleed, scary, Ooh. you know, in the in the trauma room, in the trauma center. And so I was in the ICU with her for days and really scary. We thought we were going to lose her. And it was probably five or six days. And when you're in the trauma unit, those of you who've been there, you know this, they don't let you go to sleep. Like if you, you have to leave the room to go sleep, you're not allowed to sleep in those rooms. There's no, because they have to be able to get to somebody really quickly. So 
it was days of no sleep. And I do remember on like day three, I was so exhausted and weepy and scared and all of the things, you know, you get when you're caregiver. Um, but I remember thinking I am, I'm shutting down my own body. I'm doing real harm to my body at this point. Uh, so I did call and I'm not one to ask for help. I have a brother and I called my brother and I said, I can't, do this. I'm losing it. Like I'm really losing it and I don't want to step away, but I think I'm physically making myself really physically and mentally ill by being here more than three days without sleep and food and things like that. And my husband would drop by and bring me something, but it wasn't the same. So I, I equate that to the tough years when it's all you, when you're a caregiver, you don't get to sleep. You don't get to do anything. Um, you, you, you live for this person you know, you get up and you worry about them and you take care of them. And maybe you get uh, a half an hour when they go to a, a, a class. I have a, a friend whose uh, husband goes to a Pilates senior, a, a Pilates class, which is kind of fun. I think it's quite entertaining that they all do Pilates. But that's the one time that she gets a few minutes alone in her house. She's like, I know I should like clean this up or do that. She goes, I just want to sit and do nothing <laughs> like for a minute. So yeah, it, there's got to be a way that you find carve out a little bit of sanity for yourself throughout the day a couple of times and remind yourself that this is not your whole life. You you will you will be you on the other side of it, but this is your job right now. This is your full-time job. And and it's a really um it's a purpose, that purpose piece. This is what you are here to do and you know, do it well. Do it well. So you kind of lean into like that because you get angry and stuff like, okay, that's all there. It's not going anywhere. What if I was just decided to be really damn good at this? <laughs> you know, that's actually a good point. Um, that was kind of my goal to give my mom the most joy, the best quality of life without uh, dragging up dying from Alzheimer's because mm -hmm. her journey was about 20 ish years. So I didn't think we needed to extend that journey any further. Yeah. But that's a real tightrope because, you know, joys and quality of life could include you know, interventions or medications or lifestyle choices, because we know that those are very important for our brain health. And I know caregivers who have put their loved ones on vegan diets. And, you know, two years ago, they were put on hospice, and then they were, you know, graduated off of hospice, and they're still with us. And it's like, you know, sometimes I look at it and think, why are they still here? And it's like, yeah. you're doing too good a job. You know, <laughs> it's like, Right. But it's then, a journey, but everybody's journey is different. Some people yep. really need that person to stay around, and just I, be, even if they're in that state. I think that's part of it. But so how do we go from, like, I always had like this underlying resentment, like, mm. you know, I have one child. Oh, I had no idea how to raise children. I'd raised puppies. So I'm like, well, we'll just follow that method. Pretty <laughs> similar, you know, consistent, loving discipline. I know some people are probably You're not allowed cringe. to crate them and leave. That was the thing. <laughs> you true. can't crate them and leave. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I never did that with her. Uh, did did feel like it occasionally, but no, oh, yeah. yeah, didn't did not stick her in the. Actually, most of my dogs have not been crate trained, um, <laughs> especially the current one who's laying on her back on the couch here in the office. <laughs> um, but my and my mother was a terrible caregiver to her mom, so it was like, why the hell is everybody? in my world and society in general expecting me to be like super caregiver woman when everybody around me was terrible <laughs> it's just like well I so i had mm -hmm. i yeah. had the resentment um and i never really felt like it was like i didn't feel like caring for my mom was my purpose but share using that journey i guess to you know help other people other caregivers because now this year 2024 i've also started speaking gigs and i try to talk to corporations about hey, like hello <laughs> you're aware that this uh, elder care stuff and this you know cognitive cognitive decline diseases already is costing you money right let me right. tell you how to fix that because you know you and i are the same age if they don't fix that real soon i don't want to be around I, my goal is to live as long as my paternal grandmother. She was 103. I don't want to be around that long if our economy implodes because people are leaving the workforce to care for a loved one. Now they don't have money to buy the widget or the SaaS platform for uh, the business they couldn't start. And I mean, it's kind of scary when you think about how bad it could get. I don't think we'll get that far, but 
you know, it's like I've had to keep reinventing myself during caregiving and post caregiving. So how do we mm-hmm. help? How do we help the listeners who feel the way I did kind of resentful, but still wanting to do a really good job and then being really frustrated that that's like two different things. I think that's a hundred percent the, the, the conversation that needs to be had because everyone feels that way. There's if, if you're not a little resentful and a little angry at times, then I don't, I, I've never met anyone going through this journey. Who's not a little resentful and angry at times. I mean, it's, you can be the kindest person on the planet. It's difficult. Here's how I think of it. And I, I, I would love to do more research and spend more time in this space. And I, I, and in other spaces, not so much in the Alzheimer's space uh, or the dementia space. But I do think that it's something like this. You know how we have different categories of parenting? You have the helicopter parent, and then you have the hands-on parent, and you have the – like there's there's a list of different parenting styles. I think you have a caregiving style. And I am I was one of those parents that like – the laundry was not always folded and put away, but I would be on the floor doing a puzzle. And I was one of those parents that I didn't do fancy dinners and vegan stuff, but they always were fed and we were doing fun things and we were learning and trying scientific experiments with our food. It wasn't fancy food, but we'd you know, learn about it, why it was cooking. And it, that's the parent I wanted to be. I wanted, now I have a, my dearest friend. She's like, I could never go to bed unless everything in the house was put away. All the laundry was finished. I wanted to be that parent. I wanted to have the, the perfect house for my kids. They were always dressed perfectly. I was lucky if my kids, like their shoes matched, but I was fine with that. <laughs> That's who I was. I mean, there, but same thing. There was resentment when I'd be in that carpool line and the kids and you know they would jump out and they'd be in their little smocked outfits and the moms would be going off to play tennis in their cute little outfits and i was throwing my kids out of the car happy that their shoes matched and headed to work you know <laughs> but that's the mom that i wanted to be i wanted I'm picturing to- you barely slowing down at the drop off oh line. get these i had three of them <laughs> boom there you go make good grades be fun go be you everybody else is taken that's what i used to tell them every day go be you everybody else is taken um but you have to decide what kind of caregiver you're going to just like when you decide what kind of parent you're going to be and be happy with that i was not upset with myself that my laundry wasn't done i knew i had chosen to spend that time on the floor with my kids doing puzzles same thing with caregiving you can choose to be perfect as you said like the no one knows what you're going through but you and no one knows the kind of person you are but you so you can choose to be the the perfect caregiver whatever that looks like on social media or in some chat room or you can go you know something this is who i'm going to be Yes, I need to find a facility because I can't do this all the time, but I'm going to show up this many days a week with a smile on my face and with, you know, with food for the caregivers and the people who are helping me. And I'm going to be thankful and I'm going to be there as best I can. And that's the person I'm going to be. Other people are going to be like, no, that's terrible. You need to have them at home all the time and, you know, spend 24 hours with them and do crafts. I'm like, then you do you. But that's not me. You know, you have to just decide because you're you're going to have the animosity and, and all that anger one way or the other. And then on the other side of it, you're going to go back to being you one way or the other. Um, so I think it's I, I would love to I'd love to come up with some language around it, similar to what they do with parenting. Like, what kind of caregiver are you? Are you the hover pick caregiver where you have to be in charge of everything and, and tell them that they're feeding them the wrong thing every second? Or are you the, you know, the supportive kind one that just kind of lets them do their job and you're there for them uh or are you some mix in between um one of my favorite memories of my dad there's i have lots but towards the end there he would say some funny things and um there's a few fun stories he said uh my mom sat down next to him on the bed one day and he was really frustrated because he couldn't remember a lot of things and he, he he was having a moment where he realized he couldn't remember and uh he's like ah oh, i just it's this and it's this and she said his name is bob she's like well bob it's not you it's your brain and and he goes well that's an oxymoron <laughs> i was like <laughs> where does that word come from like you know i um, pulled that one out of there yeah my mom yeah. used to oh, it was it was challenging because she would say things like she'd get frustrated with herself like with word finding or just you know she was pretty advanced alzheimer's at this point and she'd look at me and go my brain just does not work very well anymore. And it'd be like, mm-hmm. oh my God. Like I, and I don't, I kind of wish I would have cracked a joke, but it was, it was painful enough to hear her say that. Cause it'd be like, you think, you know, yeah. like you have Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Your brain is not great, but I wish I had, sometimes I'd, I'd crack like a, 
oh yeah, well, you know, I have that problem sometimes too. I really wish I had cracked one of those, you know, dark humor jokes because I wonder how she would have reacted. I was always so fearful that she would react badly if you reminded her she had Alzheimer's or something because she she lived in denial about the disease long enough that she then got to the um I forget I don't always pronounce it right the agnosinosia the you don't know what you don't know stage and it was just like I was always afraid that you know you'd say something and it would just trigger like the worst feelings in her and of course you don't want to do that so i was always kind of reserved and i kind of regret that a little bit but you know you can't can't go back no you can't and there's no right or wrong way to do it i think the support groups really help and there's lots of books and things out there and like this podcast gives people ideas you know i always was learned through the reading through this process when and you know daddy was going through it was to jump into the present whatever he wherever he was that day i was there you know, a lot of times we would watch MASH. That was one of his favorite shows. He was an old military guy. And some days we'd walk out of the eating and he thought he was walking out of the mess hall. Like he would <laughs> want to go out the door because that's what you do when you walk out of the tent in MASH. And he's like, you know, we gotta go. I'm like, no, no, we're not going to go that way because, you know, the alarms are going to go off. Um, <laughs> we're going to go over here. And he's like, no, no, I got to head back to, you know do whatever. And he'd come up with some language of old military stuff that he remembered. Uh, and I would never, you know, like correct him. Sometimes we could laugh about it. it went later, he would realize. I'm like, no, wait, we're we're over here. But I thought it was like we're we're actually you're in a facility and you live down here. It was never something I would say. It was always it was always oh well, I guess today they don't want us going there. They want us going down this way, <laughs> and we just go down the other way. One night he said he, he I'd only been there for about ten minutes. Uh, and uh, I just came by to spend a couple hours with him, watch a show or something. And I'd been there about 10 minutes. He's like, you need to get going. I was like, <laughs> okay, sure. He goes, it's my night to do muster. And I can't, I can't have you here for that. It's like musters when you would count the people on the ship to make sure nobody fell overboard. <laughs> <laughs> so I could just picture him going through the senior center, counting oh, everybody. <laughs> That's funny. I, I like, like that okay, story. well, go do muster. Go ahead. You do that. I'm so glad you've got something to work on tonight. I'll see you later. But in his head, he was so happy because it was his night to do muster. I was like, okay. It was always that. hard for me to figure out where my mom was at, what her reality was. Because she was just happy just sitting around, shooting the breeze, uh -huh. you know? And she'd ask you, what have you been up to lately? And I would tell her, and I have recently, somewhat recently learned that I used to break up my day. Like I'd go in the afternoon and I'd tell her, well, it's Monday. I went to the gym. Oh, it's Monday. I went to Rotary. Oh, it's Monday. I went to Rotary. And Nina talked about resilience and finding purpose. And, oh, it's Monday. You know, I came to visit you. And then I'd give her the whole shebang yeah. all at once because she'd literally ask it all the time. And I'm like, well, you know, I can't. I didn't, I didn't want to give her the same answer over and over, but now I've learned that that's actually better because by giving her different answers each time, I wasn't really answering her question. And then I would ask her, well, what have you been up to? And she'd go, oh, you know, same old. <laughs> and that's uh, all you got. <laughs> thanks for that, you know, handy bit of data. Cause she doesn't remember what she had for breakfast, much less enough to tell you. That's all you're going to get. <laughs> I just figured she could tell me any BS and I'd run with it. But yeah. my favorite me memory, because I pulled this off so well this one particular day. So my mom is the oldest of four children. Um, she's 11 years older than the youngest, her her sister. And then there's the two brothers. And I show up this one day and this was not long before she passed away. And she goes, well, I think my brothers are normal people now. And it just cracked me up. <laughs> normal and I, people. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, and I. This is where the dark humor came in. I said, oh, you think? And I said, well, you know, I think Stephen's normal now. That's the younger of the two brothers. Ah, uh, but Richard, yeah, no. I, mm -mm. <laughs> I, I think there's did a lot. Yeah, did you ask her what normal meant? No, because I don't think she knew. I don't have any <laughs> clue where that came from. It was just like, literally was like a rocket off the side i was like whatever i'm just gonna roll with it that's Apparently, so good it was so cute and i was smart enough in that moment not to ask about her sister because if i had asked her about her sister that funny moment would have turned i'm 90 percent certain it would have turned yeah. sad because the older brother richard did not ever visit call it i have not heard from him since i don't know how long it's been since 2012 
My mom yeah. died in 2020. So, you know, that's, that's pretty easy math. I can do that. Um, but the younger brother and the sister would come fairly regularly, not weekly, but um, he, the younger brother had to drive his sister there. So it wasn't, you know, then it was about a 45 minute drive. So it wasn't easy to coordinate all that. And it, it really kind of hurt me that I was pretty sure she forgot her sister, but then I thought about it and it's like, well, her sister's 11 years younger. My mom got married at barely 19. So that made my aunt maybe eight, right. somewhere between seven and a half and eight and a half. Cause I forget what month my aunt was born. That's terrible. So it's, it makes sense that she didn't really remember her because she wasn't really there for a big portion of my aunts growing up. So, yeah, but I was really proud of myself that I didn't, you know, well, what about Cher? Yeah. <laughs> Is she normal? Because out of all of them, that was probably the least, the least normal. My aunt had <laughs> addiction issues and mental health issues and uh, it's just, she took care of my grandmother though. She did, a, she did, she did the 24 seven when the other three were not that much help. <laughs> There's always someone who steps up and is that person. I happen to live in the same town, so it was me. Um, but I could call in troops when I needed them. You know, my sister's out where you are in California. She flew all the way across the country and helped a few times um, with both my mom and my dad. One of my favorite uh, just jump into the moment stories uh, that I love to share is uh, my brother, who's in North Carolina, about, about four hours from here. Uh, he has grown boys. So do I. Uh, and so they're adulting. So, well, we got, we picked daddy up one day and he used to love this burger place and he would go get a burger and a beer. And he was, he was probably, I don't know, several years into this. So it wasn't new. He still kind of remembered who they were at the end. He didn't remember my brothers at all because um, they weren't here often, but at the time he really did. And so he, uh, and the, the sons would get mixed up with the husbands, like the father, the, their grandsons and sons would get mixed up. So anyway, they came into town and uh, my brother and his boys and me and my boys, and we all went, took daddy out for a beer and uh, a burger. And the lady comes, takes our order, and we're sitting at this long table and they bring the beers and the burgers. First, they bring the beers and they're in these big mugs and they put them all around. It's like a beer garden type place. And they put one out there for everybody. And we start to do a cheers and say a toast or something like that. And dad just sits there and we're like, what's wrong? He goes, um, where are the straws? <laughs> My dad had drank beer his whole life. Like he was a beer drinking kind of guy guy. He's like, where are the straws? And I, I said, I don't know. And I like called the lady, the little waiter, got, there's a little guy we called the little waiter dude back over. And I'm like, excuse me, where are the straws? And he looked at me and I just made a face and he goes, I'm so sorry. I will get them. And he came, put a straw in everybody's beers. And then we oh, all funny. drank our beer out of a straw that night. And it was the best memory for everybody. But he was, he was adamant, like, excuse me, like, why would we drink this without a straw? That's funny. Know. So your dad yeah. was not old enough to be in World War II, right? That was more grandpa age. No. Yes? Yeah. He was born in okay. 34. So yeah, he wasn't old okay. enough. Okay. Um, my dad was born in 41. Yeah, 41. My mom was 43. So a little older. But the reason I asked is my maternal grandfather was in the army. And that man got used to drinking warm beer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Daddy could drink horrible coffee, like horrible <sighs> coffee and horrible beer. It was, it was never a good choice. But he was in the Navy. And so he was... Uh, out on a boat, out on a, most of the time I was growing up, he was out on an aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean or someplace, excuse me, during my, my childhood. So we really became close as adults, not till he was an adult, did we really build a good friendship. And then through this, these years of taking care of him and being there with him and listening to his stories, we became close too. So I tried to see it as an opportunity. Um, and obviously it disrupted my life, but I also was fortunate because I had a career that would let me step away. Gr granted, it was hard because I still had to do my work and it's frustrating to lose a day of your week. Um, but I also, my kids were off in college, so I didn't have kids and that. That's really difficult. So there's a lot of circumstances that I was very fortunate through that many people don't have. To be able to have a career that gave me some flexibility, to be able to have my kids off at college so I wasn't running them places and running him places. Um, and my mother still living who obviously took the burden of all the, you know, Harry's the bigger burden than me as a caregiver. That's just always going to be the case. The spouse and that the spouse usually has the most 
animosity and anger towards it as well, because this is not what they signed up for. Yeah. Is that that feeling of I didn't sign up for this as a child, you kind of you're in a different spot because you didn't choose this person. <laughs> I didn't choose my dad. He just he yeah. came with. But when you're um, when you're the spouse, you chose this person. And there's a feeling, I think, of, hey, I didn't sign up for this. This isn't what I knew was coming. I'm not sure I'd have taken this if this was yeah. the case. Right. Why, so why there's that, is that for better or worse statement there. Right. Sickness and health. So I think that's a different emotion as a child and as a as a spouse, um, as a child, I think it's easier for me to be more forgiving and to be different, feel differently about how this illness is affecting him and me and our family. That makes sense. So yeah. can we do like a quick five minute wrap up on f like the top tip for finding purpose and creating resilience so that when the this chapter is over, you're not adrift in your own life trying to figure out what the heck is next. Yeah, I think we just we we can revisit the things that I, I mentioned before. I think the, the most important thing is purpose is decide what kind of caregiver you want to be um, and how you want to uh, be in this. Not what you're doing, not what you're doing. You're being you're, you're a caregiver. You're doing the things. But how are you being? How, how do you want to be? What are the values you want to be kind? Do you want to be what something that can be your guiding principle as you go through this? Um, but you don't have to be everything to everybody and you don't have to do it the way everybody else does within your circumstances and who you are. How do you want to be um, while you're doing this and give, make that your North star. That's your purpose. Like you're, you're going to be a certain way through this. Uh, so no matter what happens, you are, you know, you have that to go back to. I'm being, you know, uh, accepting, I'm being kind, I'm being what, you know, your words are, I, I'm being flexible, you know, I don't know what words you would choose. Um, but that's a big part of the purpose is you don't have a lot of choices. And life is that way, you don't always get choices. But um, you can choose how you react to the react to what's going on around you, and how you're going to be in that moment. So that's the purpose piece. And then the resilience piece is adapt in a positive way just and know that this is just a chapter in your life it is not your whole life a bad day doesn't make a bad week a bad week doesn't make a bad month a bad couple of months doesn't even make a bad year and even a bad few years does not make a bad lifetime you will adapt do what you can to get through these things and then keep a piece of yourself and decide what you want it to look like five years from now on the other side of this Maybe it's 10 years from now. I don't know how long everybody's journey is, but decide what you want to be on the other side of this and keep that peace and hold on to it for yourself and know that this is not for forever. This is only a part of your journey. And I'll share that because my mother, who's now 90, is the happiest I've seen her in so long. She, I, 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 and she was like angry and unhealthy and really went through a tough time and had falls and stuff. But now on the other side of all this at 90, it's like she's aging backwards. She has found like she started painting and she found new friends and she decided finally to move into a community and she's taking classes. And I was like, and she was ready to be done. Like she was so angry and just so I, I did not sign up for this. I heard her say that all the time. Uh, and, and I used to joke that when my dad got Alzheimer's, my mom got Tourette's. I'd never heard her curse until he got Alzheimer's. And then she sings would come out of her mouth. I was like, who are you? Where did you even learn that word? So anyway, there is life on the other side of it. I'd like to leave people with that. So find your your purpose. Decide what kind of caregiver you're going to be and, and try to be that every day. Give yourself grace if you can't because it's not easy. And then uh, and and as far as resilience goes, you know, put it in the timeline. I take action on what you can pull in people to help you and watch the language in your head that comes out of your mouth, because this is just a chapter in your book. It is not your whole story. That is awesome. This has been fantastic. Only thing I can add to finding your purpose is be very careful what kind of caregiver content you consume on social media, because as a way of promoting the show, I'm on there a lot, not as much as I probably should be. And I'll read the, one of the reasons I don't participate in social media a lot is because I get very frustrated. I'm like, well, I don't see anybody taking care of somebody who is snarky and rude and irritable like my mom. I see very difficult days. I see challenges. 
but I see really like your dad. You said he turned really sweet, teddy bear. Mm -hmm. I see compliant. I see caregivers asking questions and doing things where it's like, oh, geez, if you'd done that with my mom, whew, whew, yeah. it just wouldn't have been pretty. So don't compare. I know it's it's you know it's nice to have a community on social media to you know. So you feel like you're not alone all the time, but be mm -hmm. real careful because it's, it's, it's hard when you're looking at it and going, well, that great. That works for you. But my mom would have told you to drop dead. Which yeah. is my no. mom's version of F you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no two people are the same and comparison is the thief of joy. Do not get on there and try to be what somebody else is being. My aunt Nina was all turned into just a very difficult, difficult, got kicked out of every place she went to, was mean and like, yeah. And she was a lovely, beautiful woman. And that's what dementia did to her. On the other end of it, my dad was this stern, stern person and he became this teddy bear. So they, they, they say it lights up parts of your brain you haven't used before. So I guess my dad was never funny and cuddly because <laughs> that's what he became. And on the other end of it, my aunt, who was lovely and generous and kind, just became this really, really angry, bitter, uh, like no filter, you know, person. So yes, that's a great advice from you. Do watch who you um, see out there and who you, what well, I guess I'm starting to say want to be like, but just know comparison is the thief of joy. You fight your battles and you run your course, your race, your way. I'll, I'll run the course on my bike because I don't like to run. <laughs> <laughs> or well, I appreciate yeah um i don't even like to walk the dog who's back in the room now oh. um because she likes to stop and sniff and that is how they experience the world so it's important to stop and sniff and it's like this is not exercise for me this is boring I'm standing here next to the same bush <laughs> that we got to sniff every time we walk past this bush it's like Ugh. It's, i've got one of those yeah <laughs> yeah i'll take her to the um dog park and sit there and let her swim in the swampy pond and they can bring her home and rinse her off. So I, I'm a different caregiver to the DOG than I than my husband is. So that's actually a really good um, comparison because right, you know his you do you. His, yeah, his schedule is changing, and it's like your responsibility is to walk Luna every morning because she's almost ten, and that's expected. So right. we're not changing the dog schedule. You got to work around the dog. <laughs> but it's the same with any caregiving. My my husband and I, he walks. I have Lulu and she's uh, <laughs> Jack Russell and she is 14. And he walks her every day. And that's their thing that they do together. And then she's with me here in my podcast booth or in my office. And she's with me all day long. And I do not walk. We go outside and sniff and pee. And I let her run around a little bit. But for the most part, she just snuggles with me and hangs out. That's our relationship. That's my way of caregiving for her. I don't want to spend an hour of my day walking her, you know, so he does that. Anyway, it, it's just all the same. What kind of, I don't feel bad that I'm not the walking kind of parent. It's not who I am. I'm like you. It makes me, it annoys me to have to keep stopping. If I'm yeah. going to be out there, I want to get a workout in. Yeah, uh, so exactly. Anyway, you choose the kind of dog walker you want to be, the kind of parent you want to be, and the kind of caregiver you want to be. We're all different. And all of our dogs and all of our people are different too. So there's that, that is very true. So I forgot to mention at the top of the show that you also are a podcaster. I mean, is there anything you don't do? <laughs> what is the name of your show? Well, my podcast, which is in hiatus right now, but there's some good episodes out there and we're going to bring it back at the end of August. It's called This Seriously Sucks, <laughs> the right podcast when life goes seriously wrong. And we talk to people who've been through life changing events in their lives um, 10 years Post event, I have everybody talk from their scars, not their wounds. So anybody who's ten years past a big life altering event, they share how they got through it, uh, the things that work for them, and and how other people may be able to look at the the trauma or the or the challenges in their lives in new ways. So, and then my book for anybody who's going through a really difficult time is this is not the end, strategies to get you through the worst chapters of your life, and it may be really good for caregivers. I I do believe I haven't really thought about it in this space as much. But I do believe it would be helpful because it helps you go through any difficult time and any really tough time where you feel like you just can't go on. The book is designed. It's a story for you, not for me, to get you through the really tough time. So this is not the end. Awesome. And as listener, regular listeners know, both of those will be linked in the show notes. And I will so circle back to you in five and a half years when I'm 10 years post 
God, that is 2030. Ugh. That's okay. We're both going to be around and we're going to be yeah. healthy and take care of ourselves and our brains. Just why does that feel like so far in the distance and it's not? Oh, I know. Right. So are you going to be there? Yeah. Are you celebrating a 40th class reunion this year as well? I don't even know. I haven't kept up. How bad is that? But yeah, it would be 40 this year. We're the same age. I was in 1966. I was born. I'm 57. So this would be our 40th. 85. Oh. When I graduate in 85. Next year. Oh, next year. Okay. My my, next year. my reunion is this year. So um, I guess I squeaked in a little bit earlier than you. But I was born at the end of 66. I don't know how they managed that, but that's okay. Yeah, I was December 66. So Oh, that's how. Oh, man, we really are the same age. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> that is wild. I'm glad we found each other. Me too. And one of these days I'll get to South Carolina talking to some HR execs and some COOs and we'll we'll get all connected. I would love that. Thanks so much for having me on today too. This conversation has been really fun. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.